Um, yeah, I'm actually recording. Great. So I'm on air. Good morning. Good day. Good evening. Good, good, good part of day, basically, folks. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, this is Large Scale Scrum of New York City Meetup, the largest and the fastest growing and home, the most active last meetup in the world. Thank you for being here. Uh, today we have a special guest, uh, my all times friend. I have no idea how for how many years do we know each other? Like maybe for forever, right? Karim, yeah, uh, Harvard, lots of years. yeah, lots of years from uh, from the UK. Karim Harbert. He's a very experienced agile coach, trainer, and international speaker. Uh, what makes him even more, you know, uh, reputable, at least in 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 eyes of many, he's an enterprise certified enterprise coach, uh, less trainer and uh, also a credit Kanban trainer, and I think you're an ICF guy too, right? And um, some other accreditations you got. So, um, but all in all, you're just someone I would totally trust to speak to the less community on the one of the super important gamuts of uh, you know, less adoption in general, but also organizational design and system dynamics, business agility. I think this mm -hmm. is the focus of your work. So um, I would like to pass this on to you. And uh, without any further ado, uh, let you talk about your stuff. I know you've done some great work in this space. Uh, folks, uh, my kind ask, keep yourself on mute. Uh, if, you have a, if you have any questions, just ping them in the chat room. I'll pick them up from there. Or it's up to Karim. He may open um, after 45 minutes and um, you can ask one by one by unmuting yourself. Thanks, Karim, uh, over to you. The stage is yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Gene. So, uh, well, thanks for having me, firstly, uh, all the way from London, UK, um, via this lovely tool that uh, I seem to do most of my work through now, as did probably you. So uh, thanks. It's great to, uh, to catch up with you folks. Um, so as, as Gene said, I've, uh, I am a less trainer, and, and I've been a less trainer since about 2015, which is a long time. Uh, it feels like it's been a long time. I've been teaching this stuff a lot. My less adoption was a few years before that. Um, I'm actually going to talk to you today about business agility, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie that back to the LESS framework and how my, my framework for business agility is super aligned with LESS. Uh, okay, so you'll be, we'll be tying those two things together. Now, I'm going to dive into uh, sharing my screen. I think uh, it's going to be more engaging if uh, you look at the, the slides here rather than looking at my face uh, for, the, for the next 45 minutes. Um, so uh, uh, let's us kick off. Um, now, um, start in the obvious place, all right? Um, and that's with um, uh, woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats and two-ton wombats. Why am I talking about these things? Well, if you go back far enough, right, uh, these things were roaming the earth. These giant majestic creatures roamed the earth. Uh, and, and if you go back even further, you had um, gigantic dinosaurs, diplodocus, all of those good stuff. Pick your favorite. Really big beasts roaming the earth. Um, and the evidence shows that uh, there is an evolutionary advantage to being bigger. Okay, so being bigger allows you to fight off predators, to catch prey, to cover more ground, to access resources. It is an evolutionary advantage, right? So most mammals, at least, tend to get bigger over time because the bigger tend to survive over the smaller. Right? So if we go back four million years, you'll find our ancestors were about four foot tall. Right. Now, most of us are bigger than that today. All right. So um, we do get bigger. There is an evolutionary reason for that. Now, nature, being nature, has a counterbalance. Because you might ask the question, where are these magic, majestic, large creatures today? Well, we still have some, but not to the scale that we did. So if there's an evolutionary advantage to scale, okay, where are they? And the, the genius that is Mother Nature has worked a counterbalance into that. And that counterbalance is extinction events. Now, it turns out uh, that during a, a large shift in the environment, right, um, that it's the very thing that gave you an advantage when the environment was stable, that is, being large, that very thing was a massive disadvantage during extinction events. Now, 66 million years ago, um, the most famous of the extinction events, the, the Cretaceous-Paleogene extinction event, uh, which wiped out the dinosaurs, a massive meteor hit, 
uh, around about the Gulf of Mexico and wiped out two, well, three quarters of, of, of life on Earth, that's plants and animals, three quarters wiped out. Right? They were unable to adapt quickly enough to the new environment. Right? Interestingly, those that did adapt were the smaller creatures, right? basically from cat size downwards. Some of the larger ones, but largely was overwhelmingly the smaller creatures that survived. Now, why was that? These smaller creatures were better able to find shelter. They were able to reproduce more quickly because of the shorter gestation period. They were able to forage, to find shelter, <coughs> and to just largely um, survive long enough to adapt to the new environment. It was much more difficult for the big beasts. So what you saw was that these big beasts had the competitive advantage while the environment was stable. Then when it sh suddenly shifted, the more nimble had the competitive advantage. And then during a long period of stability, they grew and they grew and they grew and they got their competitive advantage from being bigger. And then another extinction event would happen and they would die out in a whole new batch. And thus the cycle continued. So why am I telling you this? Well, because we see exactly the same thing in the business world. Okay, and I'm going to link that back to um, the, the 21st century extinction event that we are living through right now. All right, but before I do, I want to draw your attention to two organizational dynamics, and this is largely going to frame uh, the, uh, the, the talk. Okay, so two different types of activities that organizations engage in, in various, to, the, to various degrees. Right? On the one side, we have uh, what, what is known as exploit. Now, this is basically milking your current products, services, and business models. We have a product, we are going to just optimize that. We're gonna cut costs, we're gonna incrementally improve it. Uh, we, it's known, it's understood, we can make forecasts. We know how to do this, right? This is just executing against what we have. Now on the other side is what we call explore. This is the opposite. This is how do I find new products, new services, new business models that is going to be tomorrow's cash cow, all right? This is very much unknown, unknowable, creative, and focus is not on uh, efficiency, but focus is on learning and agility over here, all right? Because if we don't know what we're doing, we better get good at reacting quickly, okay? So these are fundamentally different activities, right? and I just want to kind of leave that with you for a moment, all right? Now, as an example of exploiting with efficiency, all right, this is, this is um, maximizing your current product and service and business model. The very best example is Henry Ford right, in the early 20th century. Henry Ford, um, of course, uh, founder of the Ford Motor Company, uh, he, he had his, his model, the Model T, very famous model. And in, um, in, in 1913, he introduced one of the biggest innovations in production, and that was the moving production. Before that, people moved around to the cars. Right? After that, the cars moved along the production line and people had their specialization, they did their task, it moved on. This absolutely revolutionized the production of cars, the production of absolutely everything as well. Right? Now, why is this important? Because Henry Ford was able to go from making a Model T in 12 hours to making a Model T in 90 minutes. He was able to go from selling a Model T from $850, which was a lot in 1913, right, uh, to $300. That is a massive, massive reduction in the price. This is, if you're, if you're into strategy and the generic strategies, this is cost leadership. Right? They managed to find a way to produce the car to the same quality, but for much, much less than their competitors. And that was their competitive advantage. Now, back then, because the environment was stable, they could make a ton of money out of this for many, many years. And indeed, by 1927, 14 years later, one in every two cars sold was a Model T. They had maximized their efficiency. They were exploiting their product, the Model T, with incredible efficiency. And this allowed them to scale to be one of the biggest organizations in the world. Right? And there were many, many other large organizations springing up at that time too. Right? This was... The, the time of exploiting a reasonably stable business environment. Okay? You didn't have to come up with a new product every few years. They made the Model T for 20 years, largely unchanged. Okay? So this is a prime example. And most organizations built themselves around efficiency. Right? They structured themselves the way they managed, the way they organized themselves, the policies, the way they specialized the work 
It was all about maximizing efficiency because that was your competitive advantage. All right. We fast forward, um, well, not quite 100 years, but to about the 1990s or so, and the term VUCA you probably are familiar with. I won't go into too much detail, right? but this term started to be used in the US military college. It was only really after 2001 and the, the awful events uh, in, in your city uh, and the 2008 uh, financial crisis where people started to apply the term VUCA uh, to the business environment. All right, now VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, I am going to run through these slides very quickly because I want to go, I want to go broad, but not necessarily deep because I think that's going to be of more value than diving deeply into this stuff. All right, um, so volatility. The world changes way quicker than ever before. And there's a, a McKinsey Inst Global Institute report that says that the pace of change today is 10 times the pace of change during the Industrial Revolution. Right? And the scale of that change is 300 times. So we're talking 3,000 times the impact of change today versus the Industrial Revolution. And I think we can say the Industrial Revolution was a, was a time of real change. Okay, so we are in a volatile world. We don't know what tomorrow looks like, even more so now with, with the pandemic that we're living through. Right? But even before that, we don't know what tomorrow looks like because it's changing so fast. Uncertainty is our inability to make predictions, and yet again, we're seeing that more than ever right now, right? but even organizations are struggling to do their five-year plans because they don't know what the world's gonna look like in one year, never mind five. Complexity refers to the work that we're doing and the interconnectedness of that work. Um, so we went from doing largely complicated work, and I'm gonna dive deeply into Kinevin or complexity theory, I tend to doing largely complicated work which is predictable and understandable to complex work which has so many moving parts that we can't understand it and we can't make predictions. Okay, we have to observe the behavior and inspect and adapt. And finally, ambiguity. This is where there are so many valid interpretations of the data. This is not a lack of data. We have a lot of data. This is uh, an inability to know which of the, the valid interpretations is the correct interpretation. And actually, there may be many incorrect interpretations. So we can't really get a picture of what's going on. So this happened, right? The world is uh, changing faster, it's more unpredictable, and it's more complex, and it's more interconnected, largely because of technological change, because of deregulation, because of the greater interconnectedness uh, of, uh, of, of, of all of us. Now, this is our extinction event, okay? Um, now this just, in, this just illustrates how quickly the world has changed. Now electricity, 46 years to reach 25% of the US population. This is from the US census data, that's why I've only got uh, up until uh, uh, sort of some, a decade or so ago. All right, um, all the way down to the World Wide Web 7 and smartphones, four years to reach 25. Like technology is being adopted more quickly than ever before. All right, and if you look at the year to uh, the, the number of years to a uh, one billion dollar market capitalization, you could, I, I could put way on. I could put less than twelve months on there now if I updated this chart. I can't keep up with how quickly unicorns are being created. All right, so you don't know whether there's somebody in a garage somewhere with their schoolmate who is going to disrupt your business model. Right? If you go back far enough, it would have taken years and years and years to get to that point. But you can go from nothing to a billion dollar market cap in months, never mind a couple of years. And this is scary for most incumbents because right? their business model could be turned upside down. So I see VUCA as a 21st century extinction event. Just like that meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, we've gone from a fundamentally predictable and stable business environment where operating with efficiency and exploiting was your competitive advantage all the way through to where we are now, which is we don't know what tomorrow looks like. Okay, so many organizations are dying, and, and you can see that um, in some of the data I'm going to show you, right? But we've spent years perfecting the art of exploiting. We've designed our organizations to exploit with efficiency. We are great at that. If you've got an MBA or project management certifications, if you've spent time in management training, you are taught how to keep the lights on with what you've got. Very, very few really, really understand how to innovate, how to explore. And the, the, the structures and leadership styles and policies that work on the right do not work on the left and vice versa. 
which means we need to fundamentally change the way we operate depending on the type of work that we do. Now, some organizations are great at both of these, right? I can say Amazon, for example, absolutely super innovative in some areas, but really, really efficient in some areas, like their fulfillment centers and their distribution networks, right? So they're really great at exploiting what they have, but then they'll, involve, they'll create a multi-billion dollar organization, Amazon Web Services, they'll create the Kindle and revolutionize online books and, and various other innovations that have come out of there. So they're one of the few that really are great at this. All right? um, most organizations are heavily skewed to the left. Now, so this is, that was very quickly some of the business case for uh, organizational agility, right? So, so what? Well, leaders say this, right? Well, we need to be more agile then. Teams go away and be more agile. Go and do some agile stuff, right? And the teams are there, and I know because I've worked with teams for many, many years, and they're saying, well, we would, but you're in our way, right? So we've got this tension of why can't you just be more agile? And they can say, why can't you just stop doing stuff that prevents us being agile? And there's this, this butting of heads here, okay? And so, so this happens. Like the lifespan of organizations is shorter and shorter and shorter. Why? Because you can't make a Model T and sell it for 20 years now. Because guess what? Someone else is going to make something better. So you need to make something better and then they need to make something better. So if you are not constantly innovating, constantly creating new products, new services, new businesses, right, you are going to get left behind and you are going to disappear. This is the Fortune 500. Yeah, there are only actually 59. This again, I need to update this slide. I can't keep up. Only 59 of the original Fortune 500 companies and 53% have gone in the last 15 years. This is scary stuff. If you are sitting there in, in, a, in a big established organization, you need to be looking over your shoulder constantly. All right? Um, and again, we all know that these stories are, um, who failed to adapt even when they knew that change was coming because it's hard to do. Now, so here's, here's what I wanna actually talk about today, right? That's just setting the scene. And I'm gonna go through these very quickly. I can't, I can't go into, into depth into all of these. But here's what happens, right? I am, um, among other things, I'm a, I'm a CST and I, and I run certified Scrum Master classes, right? And um, I, I go into organizations and leaders say to me, go and teach the team Scrum. And, and I say that, well, I, I, yeah, I can do that. And I've been doing that for many years. Um, can we have a conversation about the environment in which they're operating? And the answer is most of the time, we just need the teams to go and do Scrum. We just need the teams to be more agile. Right? We need them to implement this framework, implement these processes, these practices, like what I call ways of working. Right? And most agile transformations focus there. Can we write better user stories? Should we use Jira or should we use version one? All right? uh, which framework should we use? Should we use less? Should we use safe? And that, yada, yada, all this stuff, right? which is not unimportant, right? but it is a small part of the puzzle. Here's what's missing. This is um, a model I created after working on many, many transformations. And, banging my head against the wall repeatedly saying, you are not going to succeed if you ignore this stuff, right? And this stuff gets ignored. Leadership styles, management styles, processes, practices of how you manage has to change. Your organizational culture has to change. The way you design your structure of your organization has to change, right? Your HR policies that incentivize individualism now need to incentivize collectivism and give control. Never mind your governance and funding policies. You need to move away from that upfront business case and strict project management towards a more adaptive approach. If that stuff doesn't happen, the stuff on the left, like the ways of working are irrelevant. Right? You, can, you cannot tr be successful with Scrum or with less or with any approach if you have traditional upfront business cases and change control that prevents you from inspecting and adapting. It won't work. All right, so this is what I show people, and I say, look, someone needs to be addressing this stuff. So I'm gonna run through these, I'm actually gonna run through five of the six of ways of working I won't touch on very much. All right, and I'm gonna tie these back to, to less, which I, I haven't normally done, because I normally teach this class um, sort of uh, in, a, in an agnostic way, but it'd be quite fun to see how less ties into this. It's very aligned. Okay, so uh, I'll run through this, and then I'll talk a little bit about the change, and then uh, I'll open it up for questions, hopefully in about 10, 15 minutes to go. So let's start with the first enabler, uh, leadership and management. Okay, here's, um, here's a lovely piece I took from um, Gary Hamill's book, The Future of Management, and I highly recommend that if you haven't uh, looked into Gary Hamill's work, it's great. Right, he, said, he calls this the innovation stack, where he says um, there are different levels of innovation that give you different kind of outcomes, right? So operational innovation is good. We should do it, right? But don't expect much of a competitive advantage from doing it. 
Don't expect that your consultants and your, and your customers and your suppliers won't see how you've changed your processes and practices. Spread those around, people are gonna go and leave. It's very easy to copy operational innovation. Uh, I mean, if you, if you see a car maker that doesn't use the moving production line now, I'd be surprised, right? So that is, it is a good thing, but it's not impactful because it's too easy to copy. The next level of innovation is product innovation. This is um, 2007, the iPhone, right? Great product innovation. And, and Apple got a real competitive advantage from that, right? But I mean, hands up if your phone doesn't look like this now, whatever brand you use, right? I mean, if you're still using Nokia 3310, then great, you still have Snake, right? But largely, um, most people have got themselves a, a smartphone that looks exactly like the iPhone, and they've got themselves an operating system that looks almost exactly like iOS with uh, an app store and all of that good stuff, right? Okay, so product innovation is good, just like Dyson invented the, the, the vacuumless, or sorry, the bagless vacuum cleaner, but hey, everyone's copied that now, right? So it's, it's not a sustained competitive advantage. Strategic innovation is new business models, right? This is um, Ryanair, Southwest Airlines, right? The low cost, uh, the low cost airlines, right? And, and to a certain extent, that gives you a, a more of a, of a competitive advantage, but but anyone with any capital can copy that too, all right? Uh, so it's, um, again, it's harder to copy, so you'll get more of an advantage, but still, this is copyable. Right at the top here, right, he puts management innovation, right? And this is what made Toyota one of the most profitable car companies uh, of the last 30 years, right? It's, yes, it was their Toyota production system, but anyone could have copied that. They didn't because it was the management innovation and the, the lean management that wasn't easily copied because that went to a completely different mindset and a completely different culture. And for years they invited people into their factories to take pictures because they knew that nobody was gonna copy their management philosophy, all right? So this is the most impactful thing you can do as an organization, change the way you lead, change the way you manage. Like all of the Googles of the world, um, uh, the, the, the management styles and techniques they use there are different to the traditional organizations to enable these great results, okay? Um, we won't talk about Frederick Winslow Taylor, but I mean, if you're familiar with the history of management, largely created um, somewhere between about 1890 and 1920, in that 30-year window, almost all of the tools of modern management are invented. Frederick Winslow Taylor, his, his, his uh, principles of scientific management came out, I think it was 1911, right? Um, and this was about compliance. This was about, can I get these low-skilled, uneducated people to come to work, do what I've said, and go home? This wasn't about inspiring. This wasn't about creativity. This wasn't about passion. This was about getting people to just follow the rules, right? And, and back when you are doing like manual labor like this, maybe that works, right? But we're not doing that now. We are creating. Remember, we are, we are optimizing for exploring, not exploiting now. Okay, well, we need to be great at both. But I'm focusing on the explore side because that's what product development is about and that's what less is about, right? So. We need a different way of management that doesn't play to people's compliance, but plays to people's initiative and their passions and their creativity and that devolves, that gives control, that doesn't take control, okay? Uh, and a lot of organizations are, are not getting to that point, okay? So what I consider to be the three principles of, uh, of agile leadership, um, managers need to, and leaders need to focus primarily on the culture, strategy, systems, and structures, right? Focus mainly on the environment, creating the ecosystem, right? They need to decentralize decision-making as much as possible right, to the product owners for the what and for the, to the teams on the how, right? And um, they need to help the people around them to grow because the higher up you go in the organization, the more your success is dependent on those around you being affected because you can't do it all, right? Contrary to popular belief, Steve Jobs did not design the iPhone. Okay, there were a, a, an incredible team um, around them that did that. And, and almost any innovation is, is, is uh, around teams of empowered, effective people. Right? It's not about an individual. Right? So your success as a manager involves growing and supporting those around you to get better. Right? And that's a different skill set. That is more of a coaching skill set than a command and control skill set. Uh, if I could remind you to stay on mute, I can hear somebody uh, sort of uh, having a little chat. Um, so if you could mute yourself, that would be, uh, that would be really great. Thank you. Um, so how does, that, how does that map back to this? All right. Um, well, for me, 
uh, and investors are very clear on this, managers, firstly, are optional in less, right? But most people are going to have them. And if they do, they focus on structures and policies, not the work, right? And that's really clear. That's the same with Scrum, by the way. Right? There's a real focus on self-managing teams, right? The what is left to the product owner, the how is left to the teams, and managers are there to support Capability building, absolutely. Go see, teach problem solving, and managers do not coordinate the work. The teams do that themselves. Okay, so it's a it's a very different role. It's much more of the lean management um, and what I call agile management than the traditional command and control management. So less absolutely is uh, it is aligned with that management change, whether it's on the guides or the rules or the principles. Okay. Um, so that's a, a sort of super high level overview of, of management. Um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to continue because uh, you know, it's a little tight to squeeze this in. So uh, culture. Um, I'll say one or two things about culture, all right? but um, culture is so intangible and that you can either spend two hours talking about this or, or 10 minutes, right? so I'll, I'll give you the 10 minute version. But um, whatever year you look at the version one state of agile report, Every single year, I mean, the numbers change, but this is top, right? Organizational culture at odds with agile values, that is the biggest impediment to agility. That's what prevents greater agility, all right? And so everybody knows this, right? You won't, you won't meet an agile coach who doesn't say there's a cultural uh, mismatch between the organization. You know, you see this a lot in banks, but lots of traditional organizations, right? It's like the culture is at odds, right? And one culture kills the other culture, and it's never the agile culture that kills the organizational culture, right? the organizational antibodies come to get you. I say this is vital, all right? Um, there are many culture frameworks that, we, that I like to use. Uh, my particular favorite is the competing values framework. Lots of people like Frederick Lalu. Whatever it is, right? You need to understand what your culture is and you need to understand what, your, what you would like your culture to be and then you need to actively design a system that shifts your culture. Now, shifting culture is, um, is actually not as complicated as it sounds. It's far from easy, right? But it's actually not that complicated. What you don't do, right? And this is a, this um, this comes from John Shook, who was part of the uh, the, the the Toyota um, Toyota and General Motors uh, joint venture that is known as Numi, right? And, and if you're not familiar with that case study, you should read that, right? But it's a very famous one. Here's what he said: You don't do right the old approach, or, or what they call the, the Western approach, um, which is to try to win hearts and minds, try to change the culture, try to change values and attitudes, and then hope that behavior will change, right? But if you think about it. You don't, you don't embed new habits by thinking about those new habits, right? You embed new habits by taking action. And so what they found over and over again, and David Marquet found the same thing um, in his book, Turn the Ship Around, he talks about it, right? Is that you change the behaviors, and once the behaviors change, attitudes and values change because people get new insights from behaving in that different way. And once those change, the culture then emerges off the back of it. You can't directly change culture. You can never directly change culture. Right? As Craig Larman says, culture follows structures and culture follows policies. Right? So you set the policies, which means the behavior changes, which means attitudes and, uh, attitudes and values change, which leads to a shift in culture, but it's only an indirect change. Okay? So all of the design decisions you make in these enablers from structures to governance and funding to HR, it, they are, these are going to enable your culture, but you need to very uh, definitely and, and very purposefully manage and design your culture as you want to do it and then create the right culture through policy changes. Okay? Um, so again, I, I can only go very shallow on culture. All to say is don't ignore it. Um, and, and if you want to go deeper, competing values framework is definitely something you want to investigate. Uh, Craig's saying this all the time. This is, this is one of Larman's laws. All right, uh, if you're familiar with those, and uh, culture follows structure. And John Seddon talks a lot about the folly of trying to change culture directly. Right? So you can't do that. It will emerge. Structure. How are we doing for time? We're doing okay for time. Structure now. Okay, what do I mean by organizational structure? I've, I've kind of flip-flopped between calling this organizational design and organizational structure. What I mean is how you structure the teams. All right. Um, so I'm going to, because this is fundamental, because if you structure your teams for efficiency, you will get efficiency, right? But you don't want efficiency when you're trying to get agility because those two things are at odds, right? That's a continuum. It's like there's efficiency on one side and there's agility on one. Agility is super inefficient, right? Um, because you, you're constantly uh, moving from one, uh, changing direction based on feedback. Now, 
if you want to efficiently go in a direction, you better know which direction you're going, right? But if you don't know which direction you're going, that's when you need to design, again, it's like a, you want a cruise liner or you want a flotilla of speedboats, right? And which one's going to be more nimble, okay? So the first principle is customer centricity, and you see that all the way through the LESS framework. All right, um, so back in the day, and again, this is something I got from Steve Denning, the customer went around the organization. You know, it's hilarious, but there's, there's the, old, the old saying from Henry Ford, we'll go back to him, I, uh, I can make you a Model T in any color as long as it's black, right? There was one model with one color, no customizations, we make it, you take it, right? There was no, yes, we'll give you what you want, right? But now there's so much competition, Right. Whatever field you're in, there are competitors springing up everywhere because of the, the lowered barriers to entry. So you now need to care about the customer. You need to care about delighting the customer. Right? That becomes important, which means you need to design your organization, not for efficiency, but around the customer and flowing and organizing by customer value. Right? This is a fundamental difference. You don't order yourself by function anymore, finance, marketing. You actually create uh, product-based or value stream based organizations and this goes into what the teams look like right this is a traditional org chart of a team that isn't really a team it's a group of people doing the same activity the finance team the marketing team they're not a team because they're not moving towards the same outcome it's very top down very individual incentives right because you just just do your thing like think of a sales team i don't care what this guy over here does uh, or what that girl over there does i've got to hit my numbers and i'm just going to keep my head down and hit my numbers right that isn't a team, that's a collection of individuals, right? Low trust, low collaboration. Well, and that's an activity-based team, but actually where we move towards when you want to explore with agility is outcome-based teams, right? This is, you are responsible for an outcome end-to-end, -end, whether it's delivering customer features or whether it's achieving some outcome. Now, these are autonomous, these are customer-focused, these are cross-functional. They have a shared vision, a shared goal, high trust, Lots of collaboration. That's what it looks like, right? Just like a scrum team, right? Or um, a team, as Les calls them, right? So this is now a very different model, okay? Less efficient, more adaptive. So that's the second principle. The third principle is when you scale that up, which is when you move from scrum to less, right? Um, now, there are two ways you can do that. Uh, again, I, a lot of this stuff comes from um, Stanley McChrystal, General McChrystal's book, Team of Teams, uh, but it's super aligned. Now, one way of doing it is to say, you can have those cross-functional teams, but they won't interact much. We'll have a centralized PMO that coordinates between them, all right, project managers running around, and you're just focused on your thing, right? So within the team, you're cross-functional, but those teams exist in a silo, right? Um, the other way is the network of teams, the team of teams, right? Uh, the uh, the self-organizing, self-managing, autonomous network interconnected, interacting when they need to interact, all right? Um, getting on and delivering an outcome that is bigger and broader, right? So we need a shared goal across the teams and we need high trust between the teams as well as within the teams, right? So it's become, we've got to invest time in doing that, right? Um, things like shared events, uh, common product backlog requirement, common sprint planning part one, common retrospectives gives you that trust and gives you that, that whole product view, all right? Uh, so uh, again, a lot in common with, uh, you know, with the Joint Special Operation Command fighting Al-Qaeda in Iraq and, and how less, the less organizational structure uh, it, it comes out. So it's, uh, whichever way you look at it, we come to the same place. All right. Um, and finally, I, I show you this just for completeness. Um, the exploit work versus the explore work, this is what we call ambidextrous organizations. Those that can focus on today's product and service, but also explore the new. And, um, you know, there's kind of various ways you can do this, but really I would highly advise enough distance from the traditional side of the organization so that you can create a new culture with new governance policies, new management styles, policies, tools that are different, that are more appropriate for the nature of the work on the explore side on the right versus the exploit business as usual, more repetitive, predictable work on the left, right? which may, some of these principles may, may work out, but largely as you're gonna see a lot less of those, and then some kind of coordination between the two. Right, so this is kind of the innovation center, if you like, product development engine um, of the organization. It's a fabulous book on this called Lead, Lead and Disrupt, if you want to know more uh, at, the, at the really big organizational level. Don't have time to go into that right now. Okay, so organizational structure. Well, 
Um, what does Les have to say about this? Uh, well, Les, of course, focuses highly on cross-functional feature teams over component teams, all right? That's one of the big differentiators for me from Les to all of the others, that it really insists on feature teams uh, versus component teams. Um, the teams are, of course, self-managing. Um, they're co-located and long-lived. So these are enduring teams, and the team itself is the atomic unit of the organization. We don't break those teams up when the project ends. Or the project may not even be a project. We'll get to that, all right? Um, okay, so uh, organizing by customer value rather than by function is a real key part of LESS. Um, those multiple team events uh, in the LESS events for alignment and uh, building trust are really important. Okay, and of course, if there is coordination amongst the teams, the teams decide how best to do that. Ideally, they talk to each other, but you know, crazier things have happened. Okay, um, so that's enabler three. Uh, two more to cover now. I'm not really going to touch on, on the ways of working because that's, that's not really organizational level. Um, people and engagement, this is HR policies. Now, uh, again, back to Gary Hamill, he did a piece of research here, and, and you know, when I do classes, I get people to arrange these, and it comes out like this almost every time. All right? People always say that initiative, creativity, and passion will deliver you the competitive advantage. Right? Um, unfortunately, what organizations tend to manage for is obedience and diligence, and, and, and those two always come out at the bottom. And when I say to these leaders, and say, well, you've got obedience and diligence at the bottom. If you look at the tools and techniques you use and the policies and practices that managers use from timesheets to dress codes. I once worked at a place that told me I wasn't allowed to grow a beard on company time. I was like, well, how do I stop my beard growing during the day? But apparently what it means is if you want to grow a beard, you've got to go on holiday and come back with a full beard. Could you believe the level of detail, right? So they, they are managing for obedience and diligence. That's a true story, right? But actually what matters is this stuff, is that people take initiative, that they are creative, right? If, we, if we're going to innovate and explore, we want to optimize for creativity and passion, right? We want to create an environment where people are free to take risks, to experiment, where they have psychological safety to fail and to learn, right? Not to just follow, like no organization ever in this day and age anyway, got successful by having obedient people, right? Because that's easy to find, right? So how do you design your organization, right? And again, this is from the, um, the, the, the Gallup State of the Global Workforce Place. Um, when looking at the top quartile of engagement to the bottom quartile of engagement, we see this. Like higher sales, higher good stuff and lower bad stuff, right? right? And if you had invested in the S&P 500, uh, you'd have seen this. Uh, versus the uh, glass or best places to work, this would have been your return. Okay? So there, there, there is a financial impetus to, to, to have engaged employees because engaged employees need to engage customers, which leads to um, better business outcomes. All right, you've probably all seen this though, uh, again from the Gallup uh, State of the Workforce. So uh, we've got the people who are highly involved, enthusiastic about their work and workplace, that drive performance and innovation. 15% globally, right? It's a bit higher in the US, it's 33% in the US, 11% in the UK, 10% in Europe. I don't know what you guys do, but whatever you do, keep doing it um, because you come out higher than most countries. Um, you've got these people here who turn up but don't really care. Uh, that's a, that's a majority there. Um, and you've got 18% uh, there who are actively disengaged, okay? So really shocking figures from a business outcomes perspective and uh, really um, shocking figures from just a human perspective as well. Um, quick reminder, folks, if you can keep this up, that would be uh, really excellent. I'm just gonna come off and I'm going to... Uh, just... There you go. Sorry about that. Um, uh, just so that you can, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so really sad from a human level, right? I mean, if you've got kids, like, chances are they're not going to be in that green function. And that, that's just a sad story. So on a human level, this is bad. On a business level, this is bad. And that's because we are designing organizations for compliance. And that's super disengaging, right? What works on the production line doesn't work in the creative environment. This is just super high level, what I believe various models that I've used, learning, growth, recognition, gratitude, trust and transparency, absolutely vital, right? Um, belonging, connection. We are humans, we are not robots, right? Shared vision, purpose, autonomy, right? And some of these other things, the fair pay and benefits, these are kind of uh, hygiene factors. They've got to be there, but they won't give you the, the competitive advantage there, right? So focus on this from an HR perspective. Focus on collectivism, not individualism. This is 
team-based incentives rather than individual-based incentives, and I say this with Scrum as well as less, but even more so with less, right? Uh, because these things are real barriers to collaboration and cooperation. Stack ranking, annual performance reviews have to go, right? And we have to manage for the 21st century. All right, so um, where are we? Uh, lean thinking, okay, and there's a, there's a ton of stuff around this um, in the, on the LESS website as well, also in the LESS books. Theory Y over Theory X from Douglas McGregor's 1960 book, The Human Side of Enterprise, if you're not familiar with that. Empowered self-managing teams, all right. Um, this, taking an experimental over a conf conformance, right, it's, uh, this, is, this is really allowing people to experiment rather than just follow the rules, right, so it plays to what we were talking about earlier with the creativity and passion high levels of transparency and the minimal prescription of less, which allows you to find a way of working and practices and processes that work for you and your specific context, really, really important. That's gonna drive engagement. Uh, and what Craig talks about owning versus renting your process, right, really, really important for engagement as well as uh, outcome. Um, and finally, because I'm not gonna cover the six enabler, governance and funding. Um, this is a horrible title, right, but basically what I mean by this I like the metaphor design versus build. Now, in some things that are, are more complicated and more predictable, like construction, right? You can get this, do the design, architects, structural engineers, they can answer all the questions. How far into the, the floor do we need to lay the foundations? Uh, what materials do we need to use? Where do the supports need to be? Bang, and then you just go and build and execute, right? Now, you can do that if the stuff is knowable up front, right? And the way people try and do that in software is to do the analysis, create a business case, puts your benefits in the times and costs, right? And then execute. And you're, you're managing based on conformance to that plan, right? Which makes no sense, and I've been that project manager, by the way, right? Makes no sense because this stuff is unknowable. Actually, with the more creative explore type work, design and build are like yin and yang. Like they are, are so interlinked, you cannot separate them. Everything is a bit of design, a bit of build, a bit of feedback, right? So the model breaks. The model just entirely breaks, but with traditional project-based funding, Right? When you've got the highest level of risk, the highest level of uncertainty, that's when you fund the thing. But multiple millions of dollars, go away and build this project and let's hope it works. Because if it doesn't, we just wasted a ton of money. But we'll find that out when we've spent all the money, right? This is traditional water, well, this makes no sense. But actually this happens too when people implement Scrum. And sometimes when they try to implement less, they still have this old governance process they have to exist within, right? Which makes no sense at all. Right, I get this question, one of the number one questions I get in my Scrum classes, right? How do we have a level of agility if our scope is fixed and we can't change it? <laughs> so you have to both change and not change at the same time. It doesn't make any sense, all right? We really need to get out of this existing in the current mindset and just look far beyond it, right? Um, so uh, a lot of text on this, you can read this later. Right? But I, I kind of look at this in terms of three levels, right? There's exploring, which is, we, we're trying to find the right product to build. This is your design thinking. This is your lean startup. This is your trying to find a product market fit. Lots of experimentation, lots of customer feedback, prototyping, MVPs, right? Even like just conversations with people, right? Then when you understand the product you need to build, you've validated there's a, a job to be done. You've validated your solution fixes that. You've validated that there's a business model around it and that you have the capability to build it. Then you can start building the features, but, uh, but you don't know what those features are gonna be, right? This thing is gonna emerge, so you better have a level of agility around those features. This is where I think Scrum and Less comes in, right? Because you're building, you kind of know what the, the vision of the product is now, you've got that, right? But the features and the, and the inter and, and, how, and how the UX works, is like, oh, we're gonna have to get a ton of feedback as we go. So we're, we're pivoting at the whole solution level on the left. Now we're pivoting at the feature level, which is where Scrum and Less really come into their own, right, to build this thing out. Um, then you move into just maintenance, right, of just uh, keeping the lights on, right? And you need different policies and investment horizons in each of these levels, right? For example, when you're trying to find a product market fit, you might just want to have a week-long investment horizon. Just go and spend $500 and come back with some data. But when you're in build and scale, maybe that goes to a month, maybe that goes to three months, and you, you evaluate the value you've delivered, right, at the retrospectives, but maybe uh, you know, after a few of those, you think, right, are we still heading in the right direction? Then on exploit, maybe you can fund a year in advance, because all you're doing is really maintaining the product, one or two incremental improvements and bug fixes, right? So as you can see, you've got to ramp up the funding as the risk and the uncertainty decreases. But when you've got high risk, high uncertainty, 
You just want to make lots and lots of small bets, not one big bet, right? And you better allow, inspect, and adapt as you go. So actually, this is what you want to do. These little boiling tubes here mean you're running experiments, not building a product, right? Experimentation until you validate it, and then you can start scaling it out. Ramp up the funding uh, when you're confident you are headed in the right direction. But keep a level of agility around the features. Okay, so um, last thing I'm going to say, actually not quite, um, do one more quick thing. All right, business, business side product owner, adaptive planning, which means product owner decides what features go out there, right? They don't go to PMO, they don't go to some investment board to say, can I make this change? You own the product, right? And so you can make reprioritizations the whole time based on feedback. We have PMO to answer to, right? Reprioritization continuously, especially after sprint reviews, but whenever you like, really, um, and funding products over projects. Don't want to open that rabbit hole. I get into a lot of trouble on LinkedIn when I post about this, right? People get very upset, right? But um, it's, a, it's a different paradigm, right? Funding, funding the product now, not the project. Why do we need to wrap this around projects? Uh, okay? And you think about it, there really is very little value to doing that in a lot of cases. Not all, but a lot, okay? Uh, ways of working, I'm just going to show you some of the things that Scrum talks about. Actually, Scrum is a way of working, right? So you could do all of this stuff and not even use less or Scrum. You could use some different way. You might only be building software products or any products, all right? Technical excellence, uh, we really focus on that because as Craig says, uh, oh, was it Buster? Yeah, one of them says, um, your, your, uh, your, um, your business agility is uh, constrained by your technical agility, right? Uh, specification by example, um, and the continuous collaboration, pairing, uh, mobbing, swarming, all of these things are ways of working. As you can see, this stuff is pretty close to pointless if you haven't done all the other stuff first, okay? So those five enablers, one to five, for me, are the organizational operating system, right? Like iOS. And these are your apps that you install. And now try and install an app where you don't have the operating system right. It's never going to work. So you've got to, and leaders need to get that operating system right. And then you can install these apps, the ones that are appropriate for your organization. And each organization is going to be a little bit different. Okie doke. Um, I'm going to go through this very quickly, right? Um, th this is why I believe that um, uh, organizations uh, fail in their transformation. Lack of commitment, yes. The wrong people leading the change. For me, it, of course, it's top down and bottom up, as, as it says in this in the guides, right? But if you're looking at culture, if you're looking at governance, if you're looking at HR policy, if you're looking at leadership, I, I don't care who you are, right? How, if you are not right at the top of the chain in the current chain of command, you're not going to be able to change those things. That has to come from the very top, right? To change governance, if I'm a tester, I can't walk into the finance director and change the governance policies, right? That's never going to happen almost never going to happen, right? So um, for me, this has to be actively driven by leadership, but of course, bottom up as well, but I actually don't find that's a problem. I find that most teams want to work in this way because it's a much more humane way of working. Actually, the problem is the middle managers, well, uh, changing incentives is the best way to get them online, okay? Um, too narrow a focus means not taking account into all six of those enablers, just focusing on the one there. Um, lack of a coherent approach just means getting a bunch of coaches and them going and doing stuff. Actually, you need to consciously design this. This is a strategic change. You need to make sure everything fits together, right? You're putting an a, a, a organizational design in place. Do you have the right governance policies that are going to fit with that? Right? You're putting new leadership in place. Well, do you have the team structures? These all hang together, right? So you need to have a coherent approach. Um, super quickly, you can download this for free, um, agilecenter.com. It's the business agility canvas. Right, it's uh, making sure we've got alignment, right? Vision, values, success criteria. Let's, let's align on that stuff, which lots of people don't. Then we've got the six enablers in the middle. So what changes are we going to make in each area and how do they relate to each other? And key risks, stakeholders, and obstacles. This, I got a lot of inspiration from John Cotter's work from V2 Mom, if you're familiar with that, from Salesforce, uh, from, uh, from uh, Alex Osterwalder's um, business model canvas as well, of course, the idea of a canvas. Uh, there's a bunch of inspirations I've just taken um, to make sure, when you print this off, you make sure you're not missing any of those things, you make sure you have the difficult conversations and you make sure you know the success criteria and what you're trying to achieve and you revisit it, all right? So this is what I do normally. We do the what and the why, we do the how, we do the what else, that's the who, what are the stakeholders, what are the key risks, what are the key obstacles we see, who's gonna fix those things. And then we go around and around and around, all right? It's not a process that ends. Okay, um, 
looking like I'm a couple of minutes over, but uh, it's just my trademark, so uh, I, I do that all the time. Um, looking both ways, right? You've got a master exploiting, but you've also got a master exploring now. Why? Because the business climate has changed dramatically, right? So you've got to be good at both of those things, which means you've got to really know how to be efficient and you've got to know how to be agile, right? There's no excuses for that now, okay? Nice little quote here um, from the general. Um, yes, absolutely, these things happen fast. Um, I go much, much deeper into this stuff in my Certified Agile Leadership class. I could do two whole days of this. <laughs> I did an hour of it now for 45 minutes, but we can really dive deep in a more interactive way. Uh, we can go much, much deeper into that. And um, shameless plug from my book, um, which comes out in June, and it's been a labor of love writing that. Uh, first draft is ready, got to do some updates, but that should be dropping in June, and it's basically what we just talked about, um, but in a hell of a lot more detail. Okie doke. Um, that's me, but who cares? Um, thank you so much. I'm a couple of minutes over, so my apologies. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening. I will take questions for the remainder of the time um, and stop sharing my screen. Oof, I talked a lot there. Hopefully some of that was useful. But um, questions, Gene, have you been uh, monitoring that? Uh, yeah, so there's one, uh, so, um, there was one question that was more, um, you know, where to get the studies, case studies that, uh, give you agile transformation failures. I pointed to less that works. It's a pretty nice way to get to authentic and not sanitized stuff. Uh, other than that, folks, I don't see any, uh, questions specifically for Karim. Please ask, just unmute, ask and mute. Uh, Robin Hyman, I think he's raising his hand. Robin. Could you please unmute yourself? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, hi, Karen. Thanks. Um, yeah, have you ever had success trying to, um, you talked about cross-functional teams. Um, I'm in a bank, or I've just, just finished up in a bank, um, trying to get where you've got teams, the interdependencies with teams in different business areas, and you're trying to make a case for um, cross-functional teams there. But there's resistance at the competing manager level. Um, have you ever had success in that sort of scenario and, and what approach did you take? I have. Um, a, a limited number of my successes have come in banks, I'll be honest, but actually I have had some success in banks and uh, you don't sound like you're, uh, you're in New York right now, so, uh, uh, but uh, maybe you are. Um, but uh, it's, um, so, so yeah, I have. So here's a, there are a couple of reasons why you might have dependencies, right? One could be that you're not cross-functional, in which case you just don't have a tester and you've got to go to another team. I'm hoping that's not the case, right? Um, sometimes you are cross-functional, but you've got the, the kind of private code policies that we're seeing means I can't touch your code and you can't touch mine. So, right, so, so actually, the vast majority of dependencies are, are down to um, uh, organizational design. If you have truly cross-functional teams that can change an internal open source, right, cross-functional feature teams and internal open source or, or open code, the, the dependencies largely go away. Now, how you get to that point, if you're small enough, you can kind of do it overnight, right? But, but that's rare in my experience, especially in banks. I worked in one bank and they were made up, one, one project had 24 component teams on it, right? You don't mean that? Each feature just had to go through about seven or eight teams. It was a nightmare, right? So um, I, I, I tend to prefer the more gradual, um, you know, merging teams and splitting teams. Anyway, so if you've got component A and component B, you take half the people from B and half the people from A, and you put them together, and, and they they learn about each other's components such that now they can both touch both components. Now you might have to do that a few times, and it involves investing in people to grow new skills. So you might need to, 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 to learn new functional skills, but also new areas of the code base. Um, and you need to put super solid technical practices in place that over time you can get the capability such that you can move towards it. Now, of course, the only way you can do that is if you have super high level managers um, uh, get dealing with all the politics and who really understand the value of that. Because if you don't, you're gonna get all of these people saying, oh, these are my people, you can't have these, my bonus is dependent on me having 40 people working for me and you can't, that needs to go away, which is why the very most senior leaders have to drive it. Otherwise, I've never seen it work without the most senior leaders changing incentives and driving it. So, I mean, these problems are solvable if you organize and design the organization in such a way and grow people's capability. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, probably. And I know that there are some case studies of that. In my experience, more often than not, the big scale, you've got to do it gradually. So I hope that answers the question a bit. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think it was in our case, it was the, the level of the, the seniority of the stakeholders. We needed to go higher up, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah that's that's uh, that's the thing I've heard Craig say most. You're not operating at a high enough level. If you can't, if you're coming up against this, you've got to go up, got to go up, which isn't always easy, right? If you don't have that mandate, but you've got to try. Fight the good fight. Um, any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. Thank you for that one, Robin. Uh, yeah, guys, um, great to have comments, but if you have a specific question for Karim, please just make it short, sweet to the point. I'd be, I'd be a bit rude and would push myself. But my question was, um, how would you go about setting up all those principles, not necessarily all of them, maybe some of them, if you're starting on a greenfield organization, so you don't have all those barriers we talked about in a big corporation or whatever. You have a fresh team, they're not experienced, they know nothing about all this stuff, they never made mistakes. It's your first job. How would you go about all of this? You know, the entire. I don't know if my question is clear to you, Karim. Um, I'll answer what I think the question is, and you'll just stop me if I'm not answering it, right? But but actually, you've got you've got a much easier life because you don't have these entrenched policies and cultures. You can actually consciously design it, in a, and it's not it's not really changing anything, right? So actually, those organisations you start small with a, a cross functional team and you scale them out, right? Because there's no point in scaling dysfunction. So get one team working really well and then gradually grow that out. If it's completely greenfield, I'd start small. Because actually, what I find is a small number of people um, can work wonders. I mean, I forget the exact numbers, right? But the, the number of people who built iOS was probably, it was fewer than 20 versus um, 1,600 who built um, some, some of the Android operating systems, right? So, or Symbian, I think it was a Symbian operating system, right? Um, it's a great book about, uh, about Apple. So actually a small group of people, if set up right, can be more powerful than big. So start small. If you need to grow it out, grow it out, but grow it out right. Grow it out pro with cross-functionality, grow it out with, uh, with feature teams, and grow it out with empowered execution at the team level. Um, and, and in that sense, then you, you won't have to change anything. You're just actually growing it as you want it. Much, much easier to do it like that. Is that kind of what you meant? Um, yes, that's what I mean, but it's, um, I, I've, I've, you know, it's easy to look at all the successful case studies, but it doesn't help people who are just about to get started, you know. Uh, I did a lot of consulting work too, but it was always in big corporations. Um, I don't know what distinguishes a successful startup um, agile development team from another startups. I see a lot of them having huge issues. Um, anyways, yeah. maybe well, experimentation. Well, no, no, normally it's finding a product market fit actually and scaling that out. It's, it's up in the actual uh, product they have rather than the, uh, the ways of working, right? But you can, uh, but, but actually startups, don't, startups are inherently agile most of the time, right? Very rarely do you, have, do you have a startup that just is mired in process and bureaucracy and hierarchy. Actually, no, normally it's just people chatting because when you're small, it's easier. You've got to consciously try not to, uh, to you've got to try to keep that spirit as you scale. So you, um, you know, there's a, you, you, you've got to experiment to a certain extent. And again, none of this stuff is easy. And you, I've, I've made it sound easy, right? But I've just given you high level patterns. But actually when you do it, you'll find a ton of stuff goes wrong and then you'll have to keep inspecting and adapting, use systems thinking, use retrospectives, Right. understand what you're trying to achieve and then make constant changes. Right? But it's much easier to do on one or two teams than it is on 20. Okay, so uh, yeah, read the case studies. Um, I would definitely read Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal um, but there's, and Turn the Ship Around um, by David Marquet. But um, you've just got to play around and stuff and see what works because it's going to be unique every single time it'll be a bit different. Right? So, yeah, also, Karim, I'm putting in the chat the link to the, uh, the, I think we wrote together like seven or eight, eight of us. I published it on InfoQ with McChrystal's quote at the beginning about decentralized coaching. I think that could be a good read for many folks that want to, um, you know, pick up on the idea that you just shared. Yeah. And you, your information should be transparent. I'm going to have your email hopefully available or people can just reach out to you. It's easy, right? Please, please do. I'm all over social media, LinkedIn and Twitter anyway. So, um, just shout me any questions and put my email, just send me an email. I can, I can point you in the direction of some resources if you need that. So I'm happy to do that. Um, also, I, I go a bit deeper into some of these things on my YouTube channel, which I think is going to be on the page too. So if you want to see a little bit more uh, of me stood in this very position talking about stuff to camera, then uh, you're welcome to dive into that. Now, any other questions? I know I've, we're, we're three minutes over now, three minutes past six where I am, three minutes past one where you, where you are probably. Um, anyway, we'll take one more question. We can squeeze one more in, I think. One yeah. other quick question. Oh, 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 can I ask a question, Gene? Yes, please go ahead. Um, sure. please It'll do. be quick, don't worry. Um, 
So most businesses right now are focused on, you know, managing the VUCA or not failing with the VUCA, I would almost call it, and basically de-risking. Um, you know, it's all run the business, BAU. There, there's not a lot of emphasis on grow the business or, or, or change the business. How have you found working in the last six months to try to nudge uh, the, the, the political or the financial, uh, you know, sort of operating culture to get so, a little bit of agility going, right? Not blow the whole place up, but just like, like take 5% more risk or 10% more risk. Yeah. Well, I, I actually don't consider taking, I think the riskiest thing you can do right now is to think that what you're doing now is going to lead to success on an ongoing basis. And it might do in the short term. Um, actually, I've found the opposite, interestingly. I found that people are so spooked by what's happened. And it's only those that have been able to respond quickly that have thrived here, unless you happen to be the owner of Zoom, in which case you just happen to luck out, right? But mostly, uh, most organizations have had to pivot pretty spectacularly, right? Even restaurants now are, have gone from, um, from not doing takeaways to suddenly doing takeaways, and they've had to get uh, online ordering set up. And those that can move quickly and respond to the change have, have done best. And I think people have really recognized, they're like, oh, wait, we were not set up for, for change. We were not set up to deal with that extinction event. We were set up for business as usual, but, but that's not going to work. Uh, and increasingly, that's not going to work. So I've, I've seen much more uh, willingness to, uh, to say, right, well, we need to, maybe we take a percentage of our spend and we put that aside for creating tomorrow's product, right? And I actually see more willingness to do that. Remember, you don't have to make the whole organization change. You just have to understand what's business as usual and separate tomorrow, searching for tomorrow's, exploring, separate that, but recognize that the, the current processes and practices and structures you have in place won't work. So you need to create a whole new culture on that side. And if you have enough separation, you can do that. It's just that most people don't know how, right? Well, that's where people like us come in because we do know how, right? So uh, yeah, I've actually found the opposite, but it, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I guess I don't know how long that's going to last for. Maybe people are going to forget very quickly. I, I hope not, right? Because hopefully this really is a, a, a sort of um, a sea change moment for, for organizations and understanding the, the need to respond to VUCA. Thank you. For All that. right. Yeah. So, uh, Karim, thank you very much for this. I know we have people that started dropping. Um, yeah. So, folks, uh, the transparency should be pretty high in this, right? So, first, I'd ping the link where Karim's video will be posted with the deck. Reach out to Karim directly, or if you don't know how to get a hold of him, ping me through the meetup or directly. Uh, anything that we missed here, like, uh, references or artifacts, we'll try to fill in the gaps, right? Um, other than that, Karim, I want to thank you personally for coming out and doing this. It has been a great and very consistent with what we already know, right? It, you know, yeah. consistency is pretty important here. Uh, very mm -hmm. consistent with less learning, with organizational design, with system dynamics, with stuff that we teach ecosystemically. So thank you for doing this and being the business agility, like a, so, such a huge part of agile transformation. That's even, even more valuable. Um, anyway, thank, thank you, you for joining. Thank you for having me, Gene. I, I think it's great to come and speak to you folks and, uh, and I'll come back and do this again at some point. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming everyone. Really appreciate that. All right, cool. Well, hugs and hugs to you. Stay safe, everyone. Be safe. And uh, we'll uh, wrap it now, okay? Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.